Hello and welcome to this week's What Were They Thinking? Amongst this week's news items, we have for you the results of the somewhat long-awaited intranasal spray vaccine for COVID-19. The results of last week's news item about a infant whose parents refused to allow them to receive blood from vaccinated individuals despite them needing life-saving heart surgery as soon as humanly possible. There is a variety of other judicial news this week as well, which will be equally as interesting, and almost as interesting as the bizarre vending machine showing up in Cincinnati, Ohio. There is the uh, unnerving and very disquieting revival of frozen viruses from Siberia, as though someone had never seen a particular horror movie. The breaking of a cipher from five centuries ago. A interesting blog article talking about blood clots and specifically anti-vaxxer misinformation about blood clots. Astronomical news about both the largest telescope to ever be made and Mars's volcanic activity. Starting with the uh, intranasal spray for COVID-19. The idea with this is very simple. By spraying a small amount of the various antigens needed to stimulate the immune system into your nose, you can get a immunological response. This should be enough to be able to provide protection, at least in theory. And that's where the clinical trials using the drug developed by the University of Oxford and AstraZeneca come into play. It is a phase one trial. It means a small number of healthy adults who have not received the vaccine before now. They were testing a somewhat older but existing formulation that should work. The idea was that they would take a formulation intended for intramuscular vaccinations and instead squirt it into their nose. They were given either the low, middling or high dose and either given a single or two dose regime with the two-dose regime separated by 28 days or four weeks. The results of this clinical trial are unfortunately very disappointing. There were basically no positive results to speak of, except for the seven individuals who did get infected with COVID-19 despite being vaccinated with this new drug. Going from vaccine news to slightly vaccine-related news, and to build on last week's news item about the infant in New Zealand, who had defective heart valves and needed life-saving heart surgery. In order to receive that heart surgery, they needed blood transfusions in order to survive. The parents refused to let them receive blood from a vaccinated individual. The problem with New Zealand's blood bank system, with regards to this at least, is that they don't distinguish between a vaccinated or unvaccinated individual who donates blood. This meant there was no way for them to be able to get blood for the infant in question. As a consequence, the state and hospital set out to have guardianship given to them of the infant by the courts, and the courts have decided, reasonably quickly, that yes, this is going to happen. The reason for it is fairly simple. There is no notable difference between an individual who has been vaccinated and one who has not been vaccinated when it comes to donated blood. That means there is no practical reason not to allow it to go ahead. The parents were just being ridiculous, and that's unfortunate, as they seem to have the infant's best interest in mind, it's just incredibly misguided. As the state and hospital is now the infant's guardian when it comes to uh, medical matters, the surgery should be able to go ahead within very short order. The doctors say within 48 hours of getting approval from either the state or hospital. In other judicial news, but shifting across to Canada, we have an interesting case about a naturopath who was trying to sell fecal transplants to treat autistic children, and both has been blocked by their own, surprisingly, effective regulatory body, and then given a nasty smackdown by a judge who clearly was not putting up with their nonsense. The very short version of this is that sometime between 2020 and 2021, the uh, College of Naturopathic Physicians of British Columbia issued a decision to stop a naturopath from being able to advertise, market, produce, or use 
Fecal transplants. They had been previously selling these for use with children, and they were providing them as either a pill or an enema. It's worth noting at this point that there is limited to nearly no evidence that it works for children with autism, and it is only approved for basically one condition, and that has to do with recurring infections from difficile, which is not related to autism. The regulatory body for naturopaths decided to start an investigation after they received multiple complaints, which means in naturopathic terms it's incredibly powerful since they're not diluted at all, and the findings of their investigation were that, much to our surprise, that they had actually engaged in misconduct. This then led to their decision to issue what they call an extraordinary action, which was basically to prevent him from producing or marketing this product. Something that shouldn't be extraordinary, but will give them what small victories they can earn. The naturopath in question did not take this very well, and attempted to have the matter quashed by the courts, and in their application, they were given the equivalent of a judicial smackdown. The first of which was when the judge themselves read from the report from the naturopath regulatory body, which read that there was a real risk of harm to the public. This was when they were investigating the naturopath for professional misconduct and unprofessional conduct, which they found they had committed. Which is a truly surprising outcome, given naturopathic regulation is about as effective as naturopathy is itself, diluted to the point of meaninglessness. When attempting to appeal it, the judge not only pointed out that the investigation had very, very clearly pointed out that they're engaging in untowards behaviour, that their treatment, so to speak, had no backing behind it, and that their entire process of creating it was incredibly questionable and unsafe. Speaking of safety, the interesting vending machine we mentioned at the start of this video comes into play at this time, and specifically with regards to harm reduction. It is very unique as far as vending machines go outside of Japan. What it contains is naloxone, amongst other drug paraphernalia. It's located in Cincinnati, Ohio, America, and what it exists to do is to deal with things like overdose and to otherwise minimize the chances of somebody having a very bad experience with drugs. Other items found within the vending machine include things like condoms, pregnancy tests, and test strips for fentanyl. The idea is simply to try and reduce the possibility of somebody dying from overdose. This is why the vending machine was located outside of a uh, safe use centre for drugs. The team estimated that they were making a quite significant positive impact to the users with a large number of people who signed up to the program and made use of the contents of the vending machine. In other health related news and specifically this time addressing a disease that we should have long since resolved, there's the World Health Organization declaring measles an imminent threat to every part of the world. Measles is a disease that we should have long since eradicated. For the most part, we have long since had effective vaccines to deal with it, they are readily available throughout most of the world, and as a result, it shouldn't be spreading. But it does, and measles is one of the very nasty viruses that you can be infected with. Not only because it is incredibly easy to spread, it only needs a small amount to get into someone and infect them, but it also causes a very high fatality rate in those who have not been vaccinated at about 10%. The problem for most of the world, and why the World Health Organization considers it an imminent threat, is that much of the world has not used the vaccines for it and especially in the last 24 months, the rate of vaccination has dropped significantly. The best way to explain this is simply this. Across the world, there is about a 71% coverage for both doses of the measles vaccine, and this is measles alone, not combination vaccines like measles, mumps, and rubella, but the simplest form. There's an 81% coverage for just one of the two doses, and most children 
should receive their first dose at 12 months and their second at 4 years. Measles is not just something you need to be worried about when you talk about fatalities, it can have lifelong implications. For example, things like scarring, sterility, and physical deformities from it. So even if they don't die, and kids are the biggest population to be affected by it, they will have other side effects that may harm them in the long term. Shifting from diseases that we should have gotten rid of to diseases that we did effectively get rid of, and now we're trying to revive in the form of zombie viruses found in the Siberian tundra. Yeah. Clearly, these people have never seen a virus-based zombie movie where we know full well the dangers of resurrecting ancient viruses from places like Siberia. It's dangerous. The basis of the study is fairly simple. The retreating glaciers are causing other effects, primarily that the number of areas where the permafrost is shrinking is growing, and these areas contain all sorts of interesting artifacts from ancient history. The frozen viruses are just one such example of what could be found, and so French researchers are taking these and trying to revive them. Somewhat ironically, they are trying to revive them and see if they're a threat to public health. Going from biology to cryptography, and specifically the breaking of the code used by King Charles of Spain, specifically Charles V of Spain. They were one of the most influential royal members of Europe in the 16th century, and unfortunately they appear to have kept a diary. A diary which, whilst it was written in code, has now been broken and revealed to the world. Well, it's possible that being dead for 500 years, they at least don't need to worry about the embarrassing contents having any real ramifications for them. The contents are, however, very interesting, primarily because they do provide an insight into the relationship between France and Spain at this time. Despite there being an established peace treaty, there were some rather hefty tensions between the two states, with purported rumours of an attempt to assassinate the Spanish king at the time. Going to modern news, and specifically looking at a very entertaining case of anti-vaxxers imploding, there is a recent documentary, or at least that's what it's been called, called Died Suddenly. It is supposed to be a documentary about the dangers of vaccines. The problem is the anti-vaxxer documentary has run afoul of anti-vaxxers who view it as a sort of parody of their own views of the world, specifically that it's so bad that it undermines what they themselves are trying to say. Yeah, they should perhaps become better acquainted with the expression, pot calling the kettle black. This particular documentary, to be generous, talks about COVID-19, and specifically tries to equate the COVID-19 vaccine with blood clots causing death, and we'll address that momentarily, but for now it's worth pointing out that, at least within anti-vaxxer circles, it's very much the Ouroboros. They're eating themselves alive, starting at their own tail and working their way towards their own head, and this particular piece of work is an example of that. In response to the uh, interesting piece of work, there is a blog post from Science Based Medicine which does talk about the uh, various claims made, and particularly the uh, argument that COVID-19 is causing deaths, and that these deaths are associated with particular kinds of blood clots that are being noted by those who are embalming the deceased. The blog post is useful for two reasons. One, the blog post links to a very effective and very well-based review of the documentary. The other reason is that it does explain many of the phenomena that the documentary is attributing to COVID-19 vaccination status. And it does explain why it is that you see blood clots developing in the deceased, and why, when they're being embalmed, those blood clots are coming out of the body. 
while we can't go into great detail due to the YouTube overlords various quirkiness about explaining these things, it is worth pointing out that the blog post has a very good explanation as to what's happening, why, and how. And specifically that much of the way this information is presented within the documentary is at best disingenuous. Going from uh, anti-vaxxers and their bizarre denial of science and at best abuse of the way it's presented to actual science and actual productivity, something useful to the world, the square kilometre array and the fact that it has finally started being built. The Square Kilometre Array, as its name suggests, is a very large project. It involves the development and creation of a vast array of radio telescopes spread across Australia and South Africa. The idea is that by 2024 through to 2028, about 10% of the total surface area, so a square kilometre, of surface area should be finalised. That is a thousand square meters, approximately 10,000 square feet. The first stage, which should be being built in Australia now, is the low frequency end, or SKA low. This will involve 500 clusters of about 256 antennas. Each antenna looks kind of like a Christmas tree and will detect radio waves between 50 megahertz and 350 megahertz. The next stage of it, which will occur after the Australian system is set up, is the SKA mid or mid wavelengths. This part is meant to detect between 350 MHz and 15.4 GHz. The South African location will use actual dishes, whereas Australia's system will use antennas. The unique aspect to this, other than the fact that it has two distinct setups, and they're both huge, is that the data from this will then be sent to the UK for processing. It'll be interesting to see just what sort of discoveries come out of this giant telescope. The final news item we have for you this week is Martian, and specifically that Mars may have a lot more tectonic activity in the form of volcanoes than we originally thought. Mars is, for the most part, thought to be pretty much a dead planet. It lacks an atmosphere, it may still have a molten core, but it's not really very hospitable to life. And the result of this is very simple. You can't do much with it. That's why there was the proposal to kickstart it by blowing up an atomic bomb somewhere inside of it to restart all of its tectonic processes. Turns out that may not be necessary. It's entirely possible that Mars may actually be much more active than we've thought. And that geological activity means that we could do a lot more with it if we ever get there with humans. The evidence for this is several fold. One of the smallest is actually the recent Mars quake, which seems to have started in an area that is showing geological activity in the way the mantle is being pushed. That pushing of the mantle means that the tectonic plates are moving. The area is called the Elysium Platitia, and it's about a 4,000 kilometer wide stretch of land. If this, plus other evidence of geological activity, is accurate, it means Mars does not have a cold and dead core as we thought, and Musk will not need to start dropping nukes on it to get it going again. This also means that it should theoretically be much more hospitable to life, but it also carries with it issues to do with tectonic activity and geological activity. Think of things like Mars quakes, and the way that would have an effect on anybody who could possibly live there. It also means that if you were to try and set up some sort of colony, you could be using geothermal energy. This is not only for heating, but for generating electricity. The difficulty with it will be drilling deep enough to be able to tap into that potential energy source. That's all the news we have for you this week. Thank you for watching. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions or suggestions you have below.